In this video, we're going to discuss sp spherical geometry. And so to kind of hook you and, and, and get you introduced to this way of thinking, I want you to think about how you could create a triangle with three right angles, or even really with two right angles. Okay, if you need to pause the video, you can, but basically, hopefully, what you're realizing is, you know, if I create two right angles, I can't make a triangle because these sides, they won't meet, they won't intersect to make that third side. The 180 degrees for your triangle would be contained entirely in these two angles. But, what if you drew your triangle on the surface of a sphere? And I'll do my best to kind of draw one. You could have one side there, and one of the sides of your triangle there, and then one of the sides of your triangle there. And you see that, okay, if you kind of picture how that would look, there would be three right angles in this triangle. Okay, and what, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to introduce you to the idea of spherical geometry. This is a, an entirely new system. It's an entirely new geometry. Um, and it's geometry visualized on the surface of a sphere. And so just to kind of give you a really quick history lesson on how this came about, um, Euclid published a book called Euclid's Elements in 300 BC, and this book was wildly influential. Um, until the 20th century, it is said to have more editions printed than any other book except the Bible, and it's unequivocally the most influential math textbook ever written. Okay, you are still using this process that he kind of coined, which is starting with a set of postulates and then proving theorems from them. This is called the axiomatic system. You may not know what that phrase means, but that's what you've been learning when you learn geometry. And in fact, the geometry that you've learned, we just call it geometry, but it's really Euclidean geometry. If you've heard that phrase before, it's named for this guy, Euclid. In fact, there's a picture of him right there. And so what he started with is he started with these five postulates. And a postulate, if you remember this term, it means something that's obviously true and doesn't have to be proven. And so if we start, just kind of look through these five postulates, and they seem very straightforward. One is a straight line segment can be drawn between any two points. And you're like, okay, that, that makes sense. It's not something that we would need to prove, but it's obviously true. Any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely into a straight line. So if you start with a segment, you can keep going and it makes a line. Given any line segment, a circle can be drawn having the segment as a radius and one endpoint as its center. So that just basically means if I have some segment, I can draw a circle that uses that segment as a radius. Okay, All right angles are congruent. And then lastly, through a given point, only one parallel can be drawn to a given line. This last one's actually a paraphrase of his fifth postulate, but if you have a line and a point not on that line, the paraphrase would say that there's only one parallel line that passes through that point. And so you might look at these five and you might say, okay, these, these seem very straightforward. They're obviously true because they're postulates, but historically a lot of people had trouble with this one. They argued about it for, for centuries and centuries, and eventually they found out that it's not necessarily always true because it can be true in different geometries, and that's where spherical geometry came from. And so everything you know is Euclidean geometry, which is based on points, lines, and planes. It's geometry in a plane, on a flat surface, in other words. And spherical geometry is non-Euclidean geometry. It's not on a plane. And so this doesn't use so much points, lines, and planes. It uses points, great circles, and spheres. And there's been a ton of progress made in spherical geometry over the centuries. Um, but basically, the study was based on the astronomy of the Earth. The Earth is a giant sphere, in, in the need to measure time accurately. So let's kind of examine and compare spherical geometry to Euclidean geometry. The first thing I want to do is I want to understand what lines are. And I put lines in quotation marks because we know that in normal Euclidean geometry, there's a unique line passing through any two points. If you have two points, you can make a line go through it. Okay, two points in a line. Or, and I could even say that that line extends infinitely in both directions. These, this is plain Euclidean geometry. Now, in spherical geometry, there's a unique great circle passing through any pair of nonpolar points. We'll talk about what that means in a minute, but a great circle is like a line. What you know about a line, we're now going to have a great circle. And while a line goes on infinitely in both directions, this could go forever this way and forever this way, a great circle is finite and it returns to its original starting point. So I'm going to pull up this link because I think it will help us kind of visualize and understand this idea of a great circle. Okay, and I have this GeoGebra applet, and this one is created by Steve Phelps. You can uh, see the URL at the top if you would ever like to visit it. But if we look at it, I really want you to understand why a great circle is a great circle. Because you might think, okay, well, if I were to go in one direction from a point, 
I could make a little circle over here on the side of my sphere, when in reality that's not the case. A line is always gonna be a great circle. Think like an equator. It's always gonna go around the sphere in kind of the widest part. And you can see that if I start with some point, let's say I start with point A and I move point B, as I move point B, you see that it's always gonna create a great circle. There's no way to create a, a kind of a little circle over here on the side. I can move point A as well, and no matter where I put it, you see it's always going to create a great circle, okay? So once you know that a line is the same thing as a great circle, and a great circle, think of it like an equator of the planet. It goes around the, the widest part of the sphere. Next, in plane Euclidean geometry, we know that if we have three collinear points, exactly one point is between the other two. And in this little diagram, you see we have point B would be between point A and C. But obviously with spherical geometry, that's not going to be the case, because if you have three collinear points, remember, a line is a great circle. So here, this would be like the, the spherical geometry version of a line. And you see, it's not necessarily that one point is in between the other two, but I could say A is between B and C, B is between A and C, and C is between A and B. So it's, it's not quite the same thing as is in, in, in a Euclidean geometry. Next, a line segment is the shortest path between two points, but in spherical geometry, an arc of a great circle is the shortest path between two points. So here, we'd have a line segment to get from B to C, but remember, if we're traveling along the surface of a sphere, that's going to be an arc, okay? So an arc is the shortest distance between points in spherical geometry. Now, let's, let's kind of extend. We, we're kind of getting away from talking about great circles. Let's, let's look at some Euclidean facts and how those compare to spherical geometry. So we know that in Euclidean geometry, two lines intersect at one point and form four angles. You can see here you have one, two, three, four angles. Well, let's see what happens. So if I have two lines in spherical geometry, that would be two great circles. And as two great circles intersect, you see I have one great circle here shown in red and another one shown in blue. And yes, right here it does create four angles, just like our Euclidean lines. But you see that those great circles are also going to intersect back here and create four more angles. So in spherical geometry, two lines intersect at two points and form eight angles. Next, we know that our Euclidean fact would be that through a point on a line, there exists one parallel line. This is kind of like that fifth postulate that we referenced earlier in Euclid's Elements. And we see that if we have a line and we have a point not on that line, that there would only be one line that would be parallel to the given line passing through that point. It's kind of like a visualization of it. Let's see what happens in spherical geometry. In spherical geometry, no parallel lines exist because remember, our parallel lines are great circles. And there's no way to draw two great circles and have them not intersect. You can see that this pink great circle and this blue great circle are always going to intersect in two places. You can see one intersection here and then one if you can visualize it being on kind of the back side of this sphere. So if I draw two air quotes lines, or in other words, two great circles, they will intersect in two places. There are no parallel lines. Next, we know that in Euclidean geometry, perpendicular lines form four right angles. You can see one, two, three, four, and all the angles are right. So hopefully you're kind of guessing where we're going to go with spherical geometry. But in spherical geometry, perpendicular lines intersect twice and form eight right angles. So you can see if angle one, or angle one is a right angle, then we've got two is a right angle, three and four are as well. But then on the back side of the circle, five, six, seven, and eight would also be right angles. So in spherical geometry, perpendicular lines intersect to make eight right angles. Next, three non-collinear points form a triangle. Okay, so if we have any three points, they form a triangle. And in spherical geometry, hey, how about it? There's actually one of these that is the same. In this one, you can see that if I have three points, it will form a spherical geometry triangle. Keep in mind, our sides aren't going to be straight like they are in Euclidean geometry because our shortest distance between two points is an arc, not a line. So this is still considered a triangle in spherical geometry. Next the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180. So here, angle one plus angle two plus angle three, or the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three would be 180 degrees. In spherical geometry, 
it's actually going to add up to more than that. And you can kind of see there's like a little visualization of it. Let me, let me bring up another GeoGebra applet to help us understand how these angles can be greater. Okay, here we've got another GeoGebra applet. This one's created by Steve Phelps. You've got the URL up there if you would like to visit it. But I think this helps us visualize it. Here we've got a triangle on the surface of a sphere or a spherical geometry triangle. And you can see that right here we have an obtuse angle. Over here we have an obtuse angle. And over here we have an obtuse angle. Yet these still make a triangle. So our triangles, or the interior angles of our triangles in spherical geometry will be greater than 180 degrees. And so it's kind of some, some consequences or corollaries of that would be that a triangle can have at most one right or one obtuse angle. And we can see for our uh, Euclidean triangle, we have one right angle. There would be no way to have another right angle. But in spherical geometry, you can have more than one right or more than one obtuse angle. And I think that visualization I just gave us um, makes sense. And there's kind of another one. You can see here I could have as many as three right angles in a Euclidean triangle. I could have three obtuse angles in a, or excuse me, in a spherical triangle. And lastly, each angle of an equiangular triangle measures 60. We know that if the sum of the interior angles of a Euclidean triangle is 180, and all of the angles are equal, we know that it has to be 60, 60, and 60. But with spherical geometry, that's not the case. They can, they, there's many different angle measures that can happen for the three angles of a spherical geometry triangle to be equiangular. I think I phrased that sentence well. And once again, I can come back to our little program and show you. Um, I could create, you know, more triangles. Actually, I didn't really set this up well, but there's, there's multiple ways where you could see that I could create triangles where the three angles would be the same. That looks like one right there, but then you saw earlier my, my triangle that had three obtuse angles. And once again, these aren't perfect. I don't know the exact measurements of those angles, but you can see those are all obtuse, and it still appears to be equiangular. So um, triangles are just a lot different there. And here's just one quick application. Um, I want you to kind of see and understand that on a globe, lines of longitude are great circles. See how this line of longitude kind of comes around at the widest point, and it goes around on the back side of this sphere? So your lines of longitude are great circles, but your lines of latitude are not. They are not great circles because um, th they don't go around at the widest point. The equator does. So if you picture the equator, that's a great circle. But um, these other lines of latitude are not great circles. And so you can see there's, there's going to be a whole slew of applications for our spherical geometry once you start talking about traveling. If I'm traveling and trying to find the shortest way to get from one location to another, that's going to be an arc on the surface of our sphere. It's obviously not going to be a straight line because if you try to travel in a straight line from, say, Chicago to London, you're going through the planet Earth, right? So we actually have to travel in arcs everywhere. So as far as travel, there's a ton of application of this spherical geometry. Now, a couple of things to remember. Um, and when I say to remember, I, I actually haven't used this at all, but just to tell you, points that are on opposite, that are opposite each other on a sphere are called antipodal points. So if I came back here, and let's say a good example of antipodal points would be the North Pole here and the South Pole. They're directly opposite each other. If you were to picture a, 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 you know, a globe and you were to have one city and then the, the, the city that's on the exact opposite of the world, those are antipodal points. I just want you to know that vocabulary term set comes up a lot. And then some other important takeaways that we have covered would be that there are no parallel lines in spherical geometry. Any two lines, or aka great circles, are going to intersect in two places. And then lastly, just keep in mind that the sum of the interior angles of the triangle will add up to more than 180 degrees in spherical geometry. So I hope you found this interesting. I think spherical geometry is interesting. There's kind of a little bit of disequilibrium because for a little bit, everything you know is wrong. But hopefully if you visualize all these figures on the surface of a sphere, you'll do just fine.